Good afternoon, everyone. It is 4 o'clock, our final session for the WILD Wisconsin Winter Web Conference of 2013. Um, if you are just joining us, yes, woot woot, Karen says, um, if you are just joining us for this session, welcome. If you've been with us for a few sessions, or all day for that matter, um, thank you for participating and for sticking it out with us. This day went by very, very fast. and. Um, we, we'd appreciate all the systems that are co-sponsoring this, besides Nicolay, which is where I'm from. Um, we'd appreciate any feedback on this. Um, you know, hopefully, again, we can do it in a year and maybe add more tracks or add, who knows, the possibilities are endless. So before I keep babbling, um, I'm going to introduce our final speaker of the day, uh, and that is Joan Fry Williams, who is a library futurist. Many of you have probably heard her speak. Um, at conferences or on info pe people. She is uh, currently residing in Sacramento, California. Oh, I do want to point out, too, that Carson Block was the winner of the Cheesy Sweater, sweater Contest, before I forget. So send your congrats to him. So um, again, Joan is residing in Sacramento, California, and um, she's going to talk to us about increasing your impact without increasing our workload, if that is even possible, but she can tell you more about that. So Joan, whenever you are ready. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be uh, batting cleanup here, and I'm going to talk about ways to increase your impact. It's clear that library workers today are facing a lot of challenges, and let me say right out front, I do not want to underplay the difficulties of managing your time and efforts while all kinds of things are changing around you. And I certainly am not going to talk about doing more with less. I, I think that's totally bogus. Um, but I am going to talk about ways to deliver more service with the sort of effort that you're already putting in. Um, when you think about great librarians, you don't really think about people who are trying to lower expectations. You, you think about people who are really committed to making a difference. In this session, I want to talk about ways you can extend your reach, increase your impact, not by doing more, taking on more things, but by doing different things, by, by changing it up a little bit. And a little bit of uh, disclosure beginning, I, I think we actually have an obligation in the library world to try to improve the communities we serve. I think we're supposed to make communities stronger. And I'm using the term community very broadly. Um, it could be defined by geography, anybody who resides in a specific area, anyone who attends a specific university. Um, you could take a demographic filter and say your community is by ethnicity, like the Hispanic community, or occupation by you know, the business community. You could talk about practice, the library community, a learning community. The point I'm trying to get to here is that in the library world, we talk a lot about community, but pretty much all of our practices are designed around individuals. Um, we don't spend as much time, and I, I certainly would say enough time, thinking in terms of how we're moving groups of individuals forward, how we're strengthening the ties between them, or getting a community as a whole uh, from here to there. And that, I think, is um, part of a librarian's worldview, not universal, not everybody feels this way, but it's sort of the way the practice is taught. When I talk to civilians, which is anybody who's, who doesn't have a library background or training or hasn't been indoctrinated by being in the Friends or something, um, they are often looking at the library in terms of a community function, not just person by person, but of the community as a whole. Um, they tend to talk in terms of members rather than patrons. They tend to talk in terms of groups rather than individuals. I think we need to think about what that means and think about what we owe the group as a whole. Um, I've been working in uh, the concept of constituency for a while. Um, the, the group to whom you owe some debt of service. Um, when you're a professional that serves an entire community, your, your platform, your canvas, your client, whatever you want to call it, is not just the individual. It's an entire constituency, and the constituency includes the people who don't use the library and never will. Um, we need to think about everybody who's out there who's eligible for service or has a vested interest in our service as an investor, and that means designing for them even if they don't present themselves to us. 
Um, we tend to design for the exceptions. Um, that's okay as long as that's the deal we have with the entire group. Um, some libraries, public libraries for example, particularly libraries in depressed areas, um, focus on serving the have-nots, if you will. Um, that's fine as long as the haves have said, yes, your role in this entire community is to focus on this segment. Um, I also joke that you know my local library focuses on avid readers. And if you are a fast, facile, quick reader who consumes a lot of fiction, boy, do we have a service plan for you. Uh, and if you're a slow reader or you're primarily not in the fiction area, you know, maybe, maybe our policies and programs don't match you very well. Um, it, it's, it's a question I raise to ask us to broaden our look beyond the usual suspects, beyond the people who match what we're currently doing. Um, and beyond what we like doing. Uh, frequently we work on the work that we enjoy the most rather than the work that's valued most highly by our constituents. I did a presentation uh, last year in which I, I raised the question of the, the value of online databases uh, and a woman gave a very passionate um, response about how this, this incredible search that she had done really solved the problem for an individual and I said yeah and you know, while you were spending four hours for this person and while you were spending $100,000 on those databases, what weren't you doing? And she looked at me as if I were from Mars, this happens a lot in my practice, and basically said, but she was so grateful. Well, one of the questions is, if we're making people grateful one person at a time, while we're doing that, what's going on with the rest of our constituency? Okay. And the constituency is not competing users, I want to be really clear about that. Um, our job may not be to turn everyone into a library user, but I think we need to turn them into a library supporter, someone who's actually satisfied, I'll use that word, satisfied, with the job we're doing, even if they're not consuming the service themselves. My point here is that we need to expand our vision of service beyond individual transactions. Traditional library training is focused on, done a great job at the individual transaction level. We are always ready to help people one-on-one. -on -one. We're actually not bad with small groups either. But I will suggest to you that the long-term viability of libraries may well depend on using our talent in new ways that benefit far more people at the same time. So that's the challenge I'm encouraging you to tackle. I, I want you to ask yourself, how can I change the way I work in order to multiply to scale up the impact I'm having and the benefit I'm delivering. And I, I, okay, here's the deal. I do not want to see on somebody's tweet or somebody's post later today, Joan Fry Williams says we should never work one-on-one. -on -one. The message is that we shouldn't only work one-on-one -on -one or we shouldn't give preference to one-on-one. -on -one. We need to think about community scale. The bottom line here is desk hours, small group programs are not the be-all and end-all of professional practice. You need to bump that up by an order of magnitude. So I'm going to suggest that a lot of librarians don't do math, um, but I'm going to challenge you to perform a very simple calculation. I want you to think about the size of the service population who are eligible for your service. Not everybody who's coming in currently, but who's eligible to come in. And divide that number by the number of library staff you have to serve them. You can take a minute and do that right now. If there are 10,000 residents in your community and 10 staff members, that's 1,000 person per staff member. If you have 500 students in your school and there are two library staff, then that's 250 students per staff member. It doesn't matter what the total number is as much as that you understand that you have a responsibility to that whole number of people. If 1,000 people are your share of the service population, then that's your constituency to satisfy. And I, I'm going to suggest to you that library service is a prepaid service. It's not free, it's prepaid. They've already put the money out there and there's a level of entitlement no matter how grudging they were when they paid it. They are entitled to something in return for that investment. Um, so you've got, say you've got a thousand people who have already prepaid for satisfactory library service from you personally. What are you going to do about that? I think you ought to write that number on a post-it note and stick it on your monitor and ask yourself every day, what did I do today that has even a prayer 
of affecting that many people in a positive way, either by serving them directly, providing services that they approve, sending something out that's clearly available to them and touches them somehow. You don't have to do a reference question for them. You don't have to convince them to attend a program. But what am I doing that has some hope of touching that many people in the work I'm doing today. That is how you scale up. So I'm going to mention five ways that you can scale up your service and have more impact on more people when you're thinking in terms of that many constituents. Now you can't satisfy all their needs and expectations for which they have already paid by working necessarily with each of them one person at a time. We're looking for some kind of multiplier effect. We're looking for a way to do what we do best and have that go viral. And I think there's real potential uh, you know, about how do we think of the work and what can we do that scales it up easily. The first thing I think is something that's absolutely the easiest thing to do, and that is to lower the threshold, to create a low threshold for user engagement. Make it easier for people to find us, make it easier for them to get started, make it easier to use the tools we provide uh, without introductory training, without extensive ex assistance, without learning the jargon. Um, everything from civilian language on our materials to situational signage, to uh, working person's convenient hours, to 24-7, you know, fully functional web presence. And none of this is new. The, the question here is one of perspective. Do you or do you not think it's part of your job every single day to lower the threshold, how much effort's required on an individual's part to get started working with the library? I have a client uh, who, who I've, I've joked about in other settings, and I won't tell you their, their, uh, their name, but uh, you know, they, one of the first signs you saw when you came in their building back in the day was this enormous sign that said microforms. Now, that's a high threshold for a person walking in off the street. What was under that sign was, in fact, um, back issues of the local newspaper on microform. But it required that in order to navigate that situation, a civilian had to come in off the street and, and make that translation for themselves. I'm talking about lowering the threshold by taking that job on ourselves in advance. I'm talking about lowering the threshold by saying, let me show you what I do in a tool that you're already familiar with using, rather than requiring for you to learn a new library tool. Maybe I'm talking about um, making it possible to conduct transactions for yourself rather than having to seek assistance, have something paged from behind a desk or get a, a special permission. Um, all of this makes it uh, possible for more people to be successful without gatekeeping, without hand-holding, and thereby frees us up to touch more people in other ways. Now, there's a fundamental question here, and that is whether you believe that it's possible to set your library up so that regular people can get excellent results without consulting you directly. If you believe that by definition, excellent service means you have to have direct participation by library staff, then you are inserting a value judgment here that says that my best value is when I work with you one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm going to ignore the value that I add by working with you on mass in advance by setting up my systems. So is service in this context the result that the user achieves? Or is service narrowly defined as just the tasks that staff perform? If you imagine service and you imagine the totality of what we do in terms of what the users experience, and you lower the threshold so they can experience that without quite so much intervention, you can vastly increase your impact. And, and a small change in good signage, for example, could touch far more people than somebody standing there and giving directions whenever somebody looked lost. Another area I think has huge potential is what I'm calling proactive reference. I think that a lot of reference, regardless of environment, and this, this affects even research facilities. Um, involves circumstances that have come up before. 
Um, if we can anticipate and prepare for frequently occurring situations, anything in a public library, you know, a couple having their first baby, uh, undergraduate service, somebody's applying to grad school, you're working with somebody who's interviewing for a job, um, grandparents who are preparing for a visit from the grandkids, things that recur in people's real lives. If we think of those as opportunities to be proactive, we can get ahead, again, of this one-by-one -one transaction and, and prepare material that could be helpful for large numbers of people at the same time. We've always helped people when they get stuck. The, the trick here is thinking about what routinely challenges people and getting out ahead of that. Uh, next time a group of reference librarians gets together, um, just they could run in 10 minutes a list of common situations that recur and people seem to need assistance with, the next step then is to be proactive and pre-mediate those situations. And then here's the key to this, to set up your discovery tools so that people look things up by the situation they're in rather than by the name of the topic. So visit from grandkids is the entry point here, not the description of the material or the description of the programs, it's the description of the situation that has led the person to think the library might have something for them. Any kind of situational pre-mediated service can be put out on a website, can be served up in a variety of formats. People who didn't even know they were in this situation will see themselves in it if you recommend it that way. Um, I also like what Douglas County, Colorado is doing. Um, you probably heard about this, uh, an even broader proactive approach. They're doing what they call community reference. They sent reference librarians out to interview community groups, not individuals, but groups, Chamber of Commerce, PTAs, organized groups, about what issues were of greatest need to them. What is keeping you up at night? What do you wish you knew more about it? and then went back and did two things. They compared notes and said, golly, there are themes that cut across groups in this community. Let's prepare material to speak to those issues and share it with everybody. And what are the unique needs that I can do for an individual group and where will they send me? So they followed up with people, they brought group information back and then they asked the, the third question, which is who else should we talk to? Um, we're working with uh, reference librarians now on not just how to answer a question, but how to work a room, how to get engaged with large numbers of people at a time and get them to talk to you about what they share rather than what differentiates them in their information needs. And I think that's another perspective thing that, that informs this discussion is are you more interested in what makes people different or are you more interested in what makes people similar? Um, is, is the mother of a two-year-old similar to the father of a two-year-old regardless of their level of income? Um, what, what does that mean? What do they have in common? What can I do for both of them at the same time? I'm not suggesting we homogenize everything, but I am suggesting that finding connections between the members of your community can be part of the service and is generally valued. There's another thing we can do, I think, that will serve large numbers of people with a modest amount of effort, and that is to take advantage to all the tools that allow us to do social curation. Um, when I first saw Pinterest, I, I will confess, I said, oh, how nice for hobby people. You know, I, I, I kind of said, oh, isn't that charming? You know, people can put their little personal hobby things up here. And then I began to think about it. Uh, Pinterest is an absolutely amazing um, cross-media platform for user-managed collections and portfolios. What a wonderful way to extend the reach of your information gathering and your community's information gathering to incorporate these kind of tools in the work you do. I would suggest that shared portfolios are actually the bibliography or pathfinder of the future. That that. Anybody then can take a, a story, project an idea, make a case, draw on resources in any format from any source, not worry about the medium, put them out there in a way that anybody can access and either build upon or extend. This has a tremendous chance for viral replication. So if you're going to do a pathfinder or you're going to do something that pulls information together, why not move it into a socially curated environment? 
rather than keeping it within the library bubble, and see how many people you could touch. See how many people come in, not because they said, oh, I know, I'll check at the library, but who come in because the topic captures their imagination, and it just happens to have been served up in a place they're already frequenting by a library provider. Same thing works with fundraising. Uh, I think it's time to look at really hard at moving more of our fundraising efforts online and making them much more value-driven. Uh, anybody from a public library environment out there uh, is noticing that book sales aren't what they used to be um, and that over time we're not going to have the hard copy to, to resell. I think we need to uh, diversify our fundraising for that reason, if no other. And I'm looking at crowdfunding as, as having a lot of potential, again, for strengthening communities, making them much more um, value-driven rather than um, impoverishment-driven ask. You know, if we go and say, oh, please, sir, can I have some more? Poor victimized library is broke and needs help again. That's a very different uh, approach than going to a community and saying, um, here's how to invest in us. Um, most people are familiar with Kickstarter. Um, I've seen that used in this way. I've also seen um, Bandcamp, which is a site that lets artists sell their music directly to fans, used as an adjunct, uh, particularly to teen music programs. I'm particularly intrigued by an Australian site called Posible. That's spelled with a Z, P-O-Z-I-B-L-E. Um, that is a way to put out uh, the word about creative projects and look for people to fund creative projects in the primarily in the nonprofit sector. I think there's a good match there for libraries. Um, one of the values of this sort of tool is that it lets us understand the demand or the support for an idea before we move forward. Um, there's a fundamental, what do you think, is this worth it, put your money where your mouth is, uh, question that I think we don't ask often enough. In, in the library world, frequently we decide what we think is going to be good for people. We spend a lot of time and effort perfecting it, and then we take it out there, and we're really disappointed when people don't jump up and down and respond to it the way we hoped they would. Um, we're still out there flogging those databases, and I, I think that part of the, the value proposition and part of the, the respect relationship we ought to have with our community is, is some sort of participation in, in directing what our, our, our new uh, endeavors might be. Um, another area that I think is, is un, unexplored, uh, to my knowledge, maybe I've just missed it, um, with these tools, is to pledge in units that have nothing to do with cash. I'm particularly intrigued by the notion of using a crowdfunding approach for volunteer uh, development, to put ideas out around, uh, you know, would you volunteer to work on this as opposed to would you volunteer to work at the library? Um, I think the, the, the general civilian world's notion of what's going on at the library lags behind what the real possibilities are, and if we put some appealing uh, projects or activities out in this environment, we might get a very different sign up than if we just say, don't you want to be a volunteer down at the library? So the, the pledge will be in, say, hours rather than, than dollars. And the last of the five ways I think that we might look at uh, extending the reach of our services in new ways is to open a lot more of our data sets. Um, there is now pretty clearly established capability for pretty much anyone to access, to work with, to model, and to use data in an open environment. And remarkably, government is leading the way here. Um, sites like data.gov uh, put up literally thousands of data sets with the metadata, with the instructions for using the data. It's all there, freely accessible. Um, and libraries aren't participating very actively in this. I, I think, uh, why not? make our non-confidential library data openly available and see what the rest of the world can do with it. Um, we, you know, yes, we're not going to publish our patron data in, you know, name and address format, but I, I think there's a lot of information that we gather that never leaves our house. And I would be very interested to, to see how it correlates with other things. If, if we want to make 
a case for the impact of libraries, I think one of the quickest ways to get there would be to disclose enough information about ourselves so that, that the rest of the world could see how it connects and mashes up um, with what else is going on that they care about. Um, we might even pose this as a contest. I don't, I don't know if you've seen um, Kaggle. That's K-A-G-G-L-E. Um, that's a platform uh, for competition in the area of forecasting, data prediction. So an organization posts their data, and they post a challenge uh, to have it scrutinized by, and this is the world's best data scientist, in exchange for a prize, the competitors are, are going, they provide an algorithm for making a prediction based on the available data. So a hospital puts up its data and asks the data crunching community, people actually enjoy doing this for sport and recreation, to solve a problem such as uh, creating an algorithm to predict the number of beds needed in the future in, in the hospital in a region. Um, and the data scientists scour other data sources, they look for correlations, they, they crunch the numbers, and they post intriguing uh, solutions to some of these problems. I, I think they're powerful new tools um, for understanding what's going on in our communities and our libraries, and these tools make it possible to expand the talent pool that we're currently drawing on. We can up our game as librarians by finding ways to incorporate people with other talents, uh, invite some other brains to think about some of our problems and propose innovative solutions based not on their misconceptions or their, you know, what they learned in seventh grade about the role or the capability of the library, but on actual data. Um, I seldom talk to an elected official who isn't surprised at how much data we collect and how closely we monitor activities and how counter to the trends they think they understand those data actually run. So if, if um, we're looking for a way to gain street cred, to harness other intelligence, and to uh, make a better case politically, I think moving our data into the public domain so that spokespeople other than library people are talking about what it means, um, we've got a way to increase our impact right there. Uh, using a, a product, that data, that we already have. So those are some ways to change the service. You may not be in a position to change your library services, but I, I think you can still change the way you work um, to increase your own impact. Um, this is all about having influence. This is about, uh, some people talk about leading from any position. Uh, basically, it's about, for my mind, multiplying the, the pathways to success, increasing the odds that you'll have an influence over somebody else or that one of your ideas will actually take hold. And I'm going to suggest a couple of ways to do that. Um, the first is to really understand what you're doing. And I, I like process mapping. I recommend that you map your processes. Um, it's just salutary. Maybe, you know, New Year's is the time to do this. Every once in a while, just take a good hard look at all the steps in the processes you're doing and think about how you might save a few of those steps. Um, you know, what am I doing? What order do I do it in? Where and how am I touching other people? Is, are they the right people? Should I be going to somebody else? How are things getting bogged down? And I like drawing maps because I'm somebody who likes drawing maps. You don't have to do it that formally, but think it through. And the more frequently performed a task is, the more value there is in taking a pretty close look at it. A small change adds up to a lot of time and effort saved if you're doing a lot of repetitions. And this is entirely under control. This doesn't require talking to other people. This doesn't require uh, asking permission. This is the kind of thing you can think about on your commute. It, it's not that hard, people. Um, but it requires that you take a step back and say, what am I doing first, second, and third? Is that the right order to do it in? Or you can come in from the other end rather than building the process from the ground up. You can say, where am I getting stuck? And then work out from your stuck points and saying, okay, you know, what happens right before that and what happens right after that? And, and is that, that stuck place in the right place? Um, lots of steps and reprocesses are added to the process just in case some disaster might happen. So there's also a probabilities uh, element here. How often do I, do I expect this disaster is going to occur? How likely is it? What would it take to fix the problem? 
back in the late 18th century when I was in, in an undergraduate, I worked in my, my college library and I did a lot of filing and back then it was manual filing and there were lots and lots of carbons of various files and I was one day said, you know, why are there 18 files here? One in, in order by accession number, one in order by author, one in order by title, one in order by publisher. And it was in case something went wrong with one of the shipments. And I thought, they are paying a part-time student, and admittedly it was part-time student wages, but they are paying me what amounted to thousands of dollars a year to guard against something that never happened, that, that came up, you know, once every six months. It would have been just as easy for me to just throw all of those carbons in a box and sort through them if I needed to find one. But instead I had this elaborate filing process that kept me employed. Um, the, you're spending time on prevention now, and I think right-sizing that time to the size of the disaster or the uh, size of the recovery effort required uh, is another important part of process mapping. I'd suggest that you can uh, up your own impact by really being clearly focused at all times on results. Um, it's not enough to have good intentions or good ideas or good policies or good documentation or good technique or good spelling. It all boils down to this, what difference am I making right now? Is this making a difference? And if it isn't, what can I change to make it get the result I'm looking for? The number of tasks we perform, even though we know they're not moving us toward the desired result, is staggering. And I've got to tell you, disheartening. Um, if, and, you know, I'm not your boss, so I'm going to say if it takes stealth, guile, disobedience, whatever, to get the result instead of, worrying so much about style points, um, you know, go there. Uh, questioning, in a nice way, but certainly questioning yourself and, and saying, is this moving me closer to the result I'm supposed to get? Because if it isn't, I've got to try something else. I also think, um, and this is a fun one to experiment with, uh, looking for opportunities to, to have some influence frequently is not about being the leader at the front of the charge. I actually think in many libraries, the most influential person is the second one in, okay? Because somebody gets a great idea, and they're out there trying to flog it, and they're trying to convince people, and everybody is naturally skeptical. That's just normal. They're naturally skeptical. And this is this lone nut <laughs> trying, to, trying to get some traction on something. If you step forward, if you are the second person and, and you express the will to take something on, you will turn that lone nut into a leader. And it is remarkable. You've seen this happen time and time again. You step forward. You say, yeah, this makes sense to me. I'll go with you. And suddenly people are joining in. So if, if you're not a be out in front kind of person, if you're tired of being the leader who no one follows, if you really feel alone sometimes, you know, soul voice crying in the wilderness, hang back a little bit and look for an opportunity to be the second guy on board. Um, that impact actually is frequently greater than the first. Another thing you can do um, to make sure that your ideas will have an impact is to think carefully about what the world will be like if this actually works. Librarians are fabulous at thinking of all the things that might go wrong. I have sat in committee meeting after committee meeting with endless discussion of all the, the possibilities, likely and unlikely, of disaster. But there's very little time spent on what happens if something is a crazy mad success. Um, and so we go down a path and then are shocked, shocked, when our constituency, our community, responds positively and says, yeah, we want us some more of that. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that happens is we get nervous and we start to ration. You know, if you like two hours on the computer, you will love one hour because we had no idea there would be so much demand for this. I think we need to plan for the demand. I think we need to uh, go in assuming 
that lots of people will be interested. And if we don't have that confidence, and we haven't tested that proposition, then we're not really prepared. And I'll, I'll share this with you. What often happens, in my practice anyway, is I get called because people had a, a good idea. They figured out a way to do it that was very staff and labor intensive. And then when the demand went up, there was no way to ramp up their technique because it required more staff. One of the things you can do is prepare for a successful expansion using techniques that don't require more bodies. So the proposition is this. What do we think we're going to do? What result are we going for? How can we get that result now? And if suddenly the demand increases three, four, five, tenfold, how can we continue to give people that result without adding staff? And if you don't have an answer for that question, be careful about where you're headed. Because you, you paint yourself into a corner. It is very frustrating when you know people want something from you and you really aren't staffed to provide it. And it's not their fault for wanting it. And they're not being unreasonable once you've given them a taste. What we need to do is plan for that success and have an idea of how we're going to expand the service before we get started. And that expansion, realistically, can't require more people. Here's something else you can do. And that's, um, well, it's failing, but I'll put quotes, air quotes around the word fail. Um, I hear in a lot of settings that it's OK to make mistakes. We encourage mistakes. Uh, creativity leads to mistakes. And I've got to tell you, I don't think that's true. Just generally saying, well, it's fine to make mistakes. We are a mistake intolerant culture. There, there are people in libraries who eat dirt rather than let a typo go out. I mean. I, we do not like mistakes. We have a very high value placed on accuracy, precision, perfection. Um, so it's only OK to make mistakes in a library if it's clear that you're learning something useful from the mistakes and that you're applying what you learned the next time you're in that kind of situation. Okay? It's, it's OK to make mistakes if the mistake helps improve your capacity for the future. And, I, and that's what I call failing in the right direction. So if you want the cover to experiment, um, I recommend that you do short experiments, that you recalibrate frequently, and that you discuss what you're doing, not in terms of, oh, well, failure is fine, but of saying, here's what I did, here's what my analysis told me, here's what I learned, here's what I'm going to change before I try it again. So that people are reassured that you are actually pursuing a mistake-free environment. I don't believe a mistake-free environment is possible, and I think fear of mistakes paralyzes a lot of people. But you need to demonstrate in this culture that any failure that you do have is being processed to move us in the right direction and is not a setback. If the failure moves us backwards, you've got a problem. You have to describe and practice your failures in a way that it's clear the momentum is in the right direction. So that's five ways to scale up your services, five ways to scale up your own game as a practitioner. Those are the ten ways to increase your impact. And I want to round this off then with some suggestions about how to apply this notion of scaling up your impact when you're choosing between options. You know, maybe you're in a, a lucky position. You have choices of how to spend your time or where to invest your, your money or your effort, where to deploy the few pitiful staff you have left. Uh, and on the face of it, some of these things look equally appealing. How do you choose? How do you choose in a way that maximizes your impact? I, I think there's some general rules. Now, I, when I say general rules, please, again, I don't want somebody to tweet and say, Joan Fry Williams said, in all cases, it will always be like this. Uh, what I'm talking about is playing the percentages. And your mileage may vary, but in general, self-directed service, where we harness the power of the patron, is going to be more scalable than mediated service. Figuring out in advance how to make it possible for a library user to do a good job for themselves because you've set it up so brilliantly is going to be more scalable than having to intervene because they get stuck. That argues for simple systems. It argues for high repetition transactions to be treated this way. And it argues for a presumption of innocence. 
Um, all three of those things may be hard in your library, but they do make self-directed service uh, work. And self-directed doesn't mean abandoned. It means that we're presuming that 80, 90 percent of the time regular people can do this, and we will intervene when they get stuck rather than in the process most of the time. I will suggest to you that upselling is much more scalable than bibliographic instruction. Upselling is basically the, and do you want fries with that? Offering a quick lesson at the point of need rather than saying, let me teach you this now because someday in the future you might need it. You know, if, if I've got somebody at the reference desk or, or using a piece of equipment or trying to do something in their own account at the library and I'm helping them, and while I'm helping them, I say, you know, do you do this very often? Because I can show you a few shortcuts right now and make it a lot easier in the future. They are much more receptive to that learning, teachable moment than they are when you say, come on down here at Tuesday or enroll in this class, and we will teach you all the things you might possibly know. At the, at the moment, they probably want your help. They don't want to be told, no, instead of helping you, I'm going to teach you. But once you've resolved their basic difficulty, that little moment, that upsell moment, when they've gotten what they came for, and you can say, and if this comes up for you, just a few minutes of your time, and I can make it a lot faster in the future, they'll, they'll go with that. They will accept the offer of the training. Um, and suggesting to everybody on staff to, to do that upsell, to ask the question, you know, you're going to be doing this again in the future, and to offer the, the shortcut or the tip or the brief instruction is a tremendous way to help people be more independent and is a lot less hassle than getting classes together. I will also suggest that mainstream tools that other people, not library people, use anyway are going to be more scalable than library-only products. And I have to say, if you're in the training business, YouTube is your friend. It's like the go-to place for how-to information. I love this guy. This guy on the screen keeps my husband from cursing when he ties his bow tie. He doesn't get, wear black tie very often, but when he does, I want him to wear a real tie and not a clip-on. And he used to, there used to be this stream of not very good language coming from, from him whenever he was trying to remember how to get the bow tie right. Now he opens up the laptop, he watches this guy, he knows everything he needs to know. For every how-to thing there is out there, somebody's doing a YouTube video. And if they haven't, you could do one and put it up on YouTube. By using a tool to present information, how to download books to your e-reader, for example, um, using a tool like YouTube that people already know how to use, you can reach far more folks, and you can save yourself a lot of time in getting them set up to use it. I, I, I think we need to piggyback on what's already out there rather than inventing our own. I'll also suggest that to get the word out, word of mouth is your most scalable medium. Traditional advertising is a blind process. Word of mouth, you've got somebody right there. And people do believe something they've heard from another person they've got a trust relationship with, whether it's a friend or a person who's just given them some good service. In, in all of my client libraries, I recommend that whenever somebody says thank you, and this depends on age, somebody my age will say you're welcome, and somebody younger than me will say, no problem. But whenever that transaction is happening, thank you, you're welcome. The next thing the staff member should say at that point is tell a friend, show your friends, bring your friends, whatever is suitable to suggest to the person who has just received the library service that it will be a good thing if they told their friends about what happened or to tweet it or to whatever, but to to add a personal mark on the transmission of the information and harness their, their viral capacity. I, I, I cannot tell you the difference it makes when somebody thinks they're the ones who discovered your service. Um, it's very successful. It doesn't take much time. It doesn't require big money. But it does take a concerted effort to recruit people to tell your story. I think that can be incorporated into everyday transactions. And boy, I could do a whole webinar on this, but um, efficiency is always more scalable than perfection. If you are getting the results you want, um, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect to be effective. Um, 
our processes and our techniques and our satisfaction with them are not as important, frankly, as the satisfaction of the people we serve. Um, we need to move them to the top of the line. I'm not talking about dumbing down. I'm not talking about being sloppy. I'm talking about being more generous. What happens in library world is we hold on to our work, perfecting and reperfecting and meeting and discussing and going over and over and over again to get minuscule returns, all the while denying whatever it is we're working on to a broader audience. I would like to suggest that we share it sooner with our colleagues as draft and work on a culture that says, don't attack me and beat me around the head of shoulders if there's a tiny flaw in this. If you see a tiny flaw, say, you know, I think this work could be strengthened if. To have drafts go out early and be collaborative rather than come out as if they were final and have people then try to pick them apart to show that they're paying attention by being as nitpicky as possible. Um, I, I'm somebody who who really will pounce on a typo. I, I, I think there's something innate with that, and there's, there's maybe a little control freakness that goes with it. But I also believe that if you mark something draft, it's okay to share it. And I would suggest that it's fear of being beaten up that keeps us from putting our work out sooner. And we need to work on a culture. Uh, I'm going to appeal to your generosity, to be generous to people who show you something that isn't quite perfected and say, Thanks for sharing this. Um, have you thought about this? I think it might be strengthened if, and then to help them perfect it rather than to complain about the fact that they already haven't. I'm going to propose two useful phrases. They cost nothing. They can seriously increase the influence you have in your workplace. Um, this is the first one, how can we? Everybody knows that when you put a new idea out there, people will raise objections. And we know the class of objections, uh, it's too expensive, staff won't like it, public won't like it, dean won't like it. Um, we tried that in 1996 and it didn't work. Uh, you know, whenever someone objects to something you're trying to move forward, instead of arguing with them, rebutting their point of view, agree with them, say, yes, good point. How can we do it this time so that we don't encounter that difficulty? Trying to convince them that it won't be a problem is, is uphill work. But to turn it into a design question, how can we guarantee that we won't encounter that this time? How can we do this uh, so that the dean will like it? How can we do this without adding staff? How can we do this uh, so that the, the, the users will be uh, as, as little disrupted as possible? And make it a question of how to accomplish what you're doing rather than whether it's a good idea. It is remarkable how this changes the conversation. It also allows people who really do see a problem um, to be reengaged in the conversation and help solve the problem rather than getting them in an argument about, well, you're just being negative or why don't you support me. Um, again, you're, I'm appealing to your generosity to ask people to help you strengthen the work is more effective than to argue with them about whether it's good enough yet. And the second phrase is this one, um, yes and. Um, this is to be substituted for yes but. When you say yes but, you are arguing with somebody. You're telling them, I just heard you, but I'm, dis I'm dismissing you. I'm dismissing what you just said. Um, and this comes out so often in, in library settings, it's, it's remarkable. It count one day, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And switching from yes but to yes and is really harder than you think. I, I made it my New Year's resolution in January of 2011. And I'm still not 100% there. It comes out like yes but and. <laughs> but I continue to make progress, and I, and I see a definite um, benefit here. When you say yes and, you're adding information to the conversation. You are not discounting what's already there. Um, so I've re-upped my resolution for another year. I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to join me and, and try this out. Because I have to tell you, I, I'm, I'd be very happy if people join me. I'm, I'm trying to start a movement here. I'm, I'm trying to get more people to commit to action at the, the larger scale, at the community level, to commit to finding some way by hook or by crook to wield just a little more librarian power 
out there in the world. I, I want us to touch more lives. I want us to solve more problems. Um, you know, okay, it's me. Secretly, I also want us to cause a little more disruption. But to do that, we need to commit to thinking bigger all around. Um, this, this work we do is not just a set of tasks. It, it's, it's not about our comfort. It's not about complying with, with the rules or, or staying in control at all time. It, it's about committing to make a difference and, and to take the, the, the relationship we have with the constituents we serve seriously and, and do what we can without killing ourselves um, to touch as many of those people a, as possible. Um, what we do is important. Um, and and I, I'm inviting you to join me to do what we can to, to work at a scale um, that makes every bit of that count. Um, so that is my proposal for today. Uh, I would be delighted to entertain questions. And if you would like to continue this conversation um, beyond today, here's my email address. Um, please feel free to get in touch. I, I'd love to continue the conversation. Back to you, Jamie. Uh, all right, great. Thank you, Joan. Again, if you have any questions, um, as I've been uh, typing in the box, feel free to type those in the question box, and we'll get them to Joan. Um, Joan, one of the questions that came in um, is, how do you balance serving the needs of the, the squeaky wheel patrons versus serving the silent majority of current and potential patrons? Well, I think the silent majority, um, okay, let me back up and say it this way. You, you change your idea of what excellence looks like and say that whether you talk to me or not, you're going to get really excellent service. So how can I set up the candy store in advance so that it's all here for you to discover, so that there's nothing hidden, so that it's accessible to people who are using natural language instead of library jargon, so that you don't have to know somebody or know an insider code or whatever, that, or take a class that, that if, I just, if somebody walked in and couldn't get some of my time and attention, could they still get a fabulous experience and really excellent results? And it's that idea that says, you should be able to get the very best even if you don't talk to me today personally because I've put so much thought into the setup. And then the squeaky wheels are to bring the people who can't quite cut it on their own up to the level that the people who are silent and working on their own can get without my assistance so that my work with an individual is not to move them from mediocre to excellent but to move them from under par up to what everybody else is already enjoying. Is the rule mediocre or is the rule excellent? Um, I, think, I think that most library work is taught as if you're not going to get really great service unless I work with you one-on-one. -on -one. And I think we have to change that notion. And why, say, do you think, yeah. why do you think that is? Why do I think that is? Yeah. I think I think we have um, taken as a given that libraries are too hard for regular people to use and, and that we've kept the libraries set up in a way that is too hard for regular people to use. I mean, and I'm, regular people includes physicians and, and engineers and you know, I'm not talking about people who have, have literacy problems, I'm talking about it, it's an arcane setup, and it's gotten farther and farther away from the real world. In the day, I mean, and think about it. Melville Dewey was in the 19th century. Right. Um, we we had a scarce inventory, and and managing it and controlling the inventory was far more important than access. And that's just that's just 180 degrees different now, where the inventory is is not the problem. It's the access and the application. And, and I think we're still working on control and organization and precision and all of that, and, and we should be working on helping people um, discover and apply. Uh, you know, it, it's back in the day, I think when I went to library school, I learned this, it's a boutique service. 
that there would be three or four discerning people who came in during an hour on the desk, and I would consult with them in a thoughtful way, and uh, you know, and everybody else wasn't a discerning, thoughtful person. They just came in and took something off the shelf and left, and that's all they got. And and that that seems very strange to me. I I actually think we need to rethink whether we can design ahead you know and I, it's this is an analogy that everyone will hate and if i weren't doing it on the spur of the moment i'd have a better one <laughs> but you know when you go someplace like disneyland uh and in california that's not as evil as it is in other places but uh, if you go someplace place like like disneyland you know most of what you're doing isn't done for you, and and they've taken a lot of trouble to make the experience really good without having somebody standing there holding your hand. Right. And they've they've put their their work into, can we make this work for you without having to do it for you? Mm -hmm. And they've they've got a very rich experience. You know, you don't wait in line without something else going on around you. You don't. You know, they, they've done a lot, and I think in the library world. We think we're doing our best work when we're getting somebody unstuck, which tells me that we're not that vested in making preventing their getting stuck in the first place. We uh. still like to take the kitty down out of the tree. And, you know, they're really grateful, and they smile. And part of this is maybe building rewards into the work that help us engage with people, but around something other than remediation. Okay. Um, you know, a, a supremely well-designed library shouldn't have a lot of directional questions. I, I think I think our goal statistically ought to be to reduce the number of times people have to ask us how to do something, because we've done such a brilliant job designing it. Um, and someone asked, how, but how do we measure our work if we're not having these interactions? Well, you measure the outcomes. You, you um, in a public library, you go to, uh, you know, the schools and you ask them to correlate the use or non-use presence absence of a library card with test scores. You, um, and I'm not saying again. I, I'm not talking about my goal of the library is to never talk to people. <laughs> I, I just think that is our first line to have a, a, a person doing it for you or with you? Or do we empower people to do a lot of stuff uh, and have a great experience and then we intervene if they get stuck? Um, I, I, we get them stuck much earlier and much more often than they need to be, in my opinion. And I think I'd like to see reference librarians, for example, work in a much more consultative. I'd like to see reference librarians offer an opportunity to take appointments so that I could really go in depth with somebody and and be their partner in research rather than show them how to fix a paper jam you know I, I just I'd, I'd like us to step that up a notch so that the one-on-one -on -one is really consultative and not operational and, and to design work that other people can deliver that that's that's something I didn't touch on much but most library work, professional library work, is trained as if you must do it with your own two hands. We are not trained to work through others. And, you know, if I'm a master chef, I can design the recipes and I can terrorize everybody in the kitchen so they cook it to my <laughs> quality standards, but I don't have to chop my own parsley. Sure. And I think we don't do a very good job of designing something that meets our professional standards and supervising the work so that people meet those professional standards, we just say, oh, no, I'll do it myself. And kind of related to that, um, you know, how can you promote your library to the silent people who don't use your library but always seem to have a voice when your budget or something else is on the line? You tell every single person who does use the library um, what's going on, but you also speak outside the library to people about the difference you're making, not to them as users, but to the community as a whole. Um, that great OCLC study um, indicated and, and was revalidated when they did it again that there is no correlation between library use and a yes vote in a, at budget time. Hmm. None, zero, nada. It's a supporter believes in what you're doing, whether they use it or not. And the way they believe in what you're doing is if they see progress at the community scale, not I personally checked out three books. 
And somebody who's, who's using the library actively now is no guarantee that they will vote yes at, at, a, at a levy or support you when they talk to their uh, city council person or, or whatever. That, that, that is a fallacy that if you use us, you love us and you want us to have more funding. Um, that's not what actually happens in real life. So we need to mobilize the, the folks who have networks to talk about their good experiences, but we also need to be able to express our outcomes in terms of how the whole community benefits. You know, um, this university pulled down this many more dollars in grants on those grant teams where a librarian was helping with the application. Or, you know, uh, that sort of what, how did it turn out sort of conversation about the outcomes uh, at comparative and community scale. Could we compare results with the library service present uh, to results to a similar situation with the library absent and show people the difference that's made that way? Turning them into users actually buys us nothing in terms of long-term support. Well, I have one more question for you, Joan, and I've asked this of all of our presenters today, and that is, and this is very relevant to you since you are a library futurist, and that is where do you, where do you see libraries 10 years from now, or what do you hope to see? And as Sarah pointed out in the last session, those are two very different questions, so I'll let you tackle either of them or, or both of them if you'd like. Um. I see a polarization 10 years from now. Uh, yeah, the what I do see and what I hope to see are, are different things. I see a polarization uh, of libraries that are um, basically trying to become the solution to somebody else's problem or doing well, and libraries that are arguing about how the people around them just don't get it are doing badly, and I, and I see that happening a lot. Um, we have to make the case not that libraries are good and people should be supporting libraries, but that libraries actually are moving communities in the direction those communities want to move. And so first we have to know where the community, as a community level, really says, yes, this is a sign of progress for us. And find out what they think progress looks like and then show how what we're doing moves along that axis. The libraries that are doing that, I think, are thriving, and the ones who aren't are really struggling, and I see that gap widening. Where I'd like to see us in 10 years is not as the warehouse only and not as the uh, you know, Department of Information Welfare, the oh, only if no one has any choices, they come to the library. I don't want to see us as the last resort as much. I would like to see libraries move into the space that says, in the modern era, the life of the mind is an important life, and intellectual fitness is as important as physical fitness in good aging, and I see an aging population that maybe we could you know, talk about the health of the whole person. Sure. I would also really like to see us um, look at what it means to be the the keepers and the entrepreneurs around our community's intellectual capital. That intellectual capital is a new kind of capital, and in the public sector particularly, no one's looking out for that. And that's, that's a currency and a commodity that's increasing in value. I'm not talking about information as a commodity. I'm talking about creativity. Uh, and, and, and that sort of intellectual capital. Uh, I'd like to see us move into that area. Uh, I think it's a natural fit for our talents. I think there's a vacuum there, and I think it's a growth area. Excellent. Well, again, I want to thank you, Joan, for presenting and for all of your excellent information. I want to thank the attendees. If you are still with me, I just want to mention that if you are part of a library system um, that did co-sponsor this conference today, um, please thank them or tell them what you thought. Um, this would not have been possible, um, all six of these programs today, without their uh, support. So, you know, hopefully we can do something like this again and even add on the sky's the limit. I think anything, we've learned that anything is possible when we all work together. I know that sounds kind of corny, but I, I think there's some truth to that. So, again, um, 
thank you so much for listening today. I hope you found these um, presentations valuable, and um, we will talk to all of you very soon.